Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first event of our of the spring quarter. Uh, it's a, we're going to have an exciting conversation with Gloria Mark, Chancellor's Professor in the Department of Informatics at the UCI Brenn School of Information and Computer Science. She's going to be speaking to us about her new book, Attention Span, a groundbreaking way to restore balance, happiness, and productivity. Um, you know, as most of you who have attended our events will recognize, this is a little bit of a departure from what we traditionally do. Uh, but as we all know, sort of our attention spans are increasingly being uh, shortened apparently. And oftentimes we believe it's because of the influence of the various digital technologies we use. And it, it's beginning to affect sort of our well being as well as the productivity we achieve at work and in our lives. And I, I couldn't think, and I thought this was a topic worthy of attention. I couldn't think of anybody better than Gloria Mark to, to speak to it. Gloria has been working on these issues for over 20 years, probably longer than that. Uh, but we were part of a center called the Center for Research of IT, on IT and organizations years ago, where I first met Gloria and I was captivated by the work she was doing. And it's only become more and more important with time to where it's absolutely critical today. But before I formally introduce Gloria, I want to remind everybody we're going to give away books to five lucky winners. Uh, the only requirement that you have for winning a book is that you attend the entire seminar. We will do a random sort of the people who are still there towards the end of the session and pick five uh, people by uh, randomly. So ho hopefully you can stay for the entire session. Um, but a couple of other things. Thank you to KPMG and the Beale Family Foundation for their support of our events, which allows us to offer these uh, events at no charge to our community. Uh, and we have disabled the chat feature for the session for this webinar. Please ask your questions through Q&A, the Q&A feature on, uh, on Zoom. The way we're gonna work this is Gloria is gonna speak for 20 or so minutes, 20 to 25 minutes. I'll ask her a few questions after that. I will signal the audience when we would like you to start posting questions using the Q&A feature, uh, and we'll take it from there. Uh, looking forward to an exciting conversation with all of you. Uh, Gloria received a PhD from Columbia University in, in psychology. In fact, what she told us is she was a major in fine arts before that, and then did a pretty significant career switch, but there are clear parallels between some of the things she's doing now and her early uh, career. She's been a visiting senior researcher at Microsoft Research, and she works in the areas of human computer interaction, which is, of course, central to what we're going to be talking about today. Her primary research interest is in understanding the impact of digital media on people's lives. And it is this uh, cumulative uh, research tradition of Gloria's that has led to this wonderful book that I have read and urge you all to read as well, because it, it really affects how I thought about my mediation, my interactions with technology and how I can use technology more productively, but also in a balanced way. Uh, she's been recognized outside of academia. She's spoken to South by Southwest and the Aspen Ideas Festival, and has been quoted in, in the major press. With that, take it away, Gloria. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Vijay. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. So let me share my screen. Okay. Is that good, PJ? Yes. All right. So again, thanks, thanks for inviting me. So I'm going to be talking about the future of our attention. And I'm going to be talking about how we need to change our thinking about how we use our devices. And you know, currently there's a big push toward let's be as productive as possible. And I'm going to challenge that uh, with some data. So first of all, let me start by saying that the, there's a lot of chaos in the digital world. Every year, there are new sources of interruptions. Uh, many people report having a hard time staying focused. Uh, there is a lot of stress. And we have a me we've measured a causal relationship between attention shifting and stress. And I'm gonna talk about that. The World Health Organization identifies stress as the epidemic of the 21st century. 
So where does this all come from? So the, the original vision of personal computing and later the internet and all the applications associated with it is that technology was designed to extend our capabilities so that we as humans will be able to do more. But ultimately, our minds are still a limitation and they create a bottleneck of how much information we can actually consume. So why is that? It's because uh, this is a long stand standing theory in psychology that the mind has a limited pool of attentional resources, cognitive resources. And there's things we do during the day that uh, allow us to um, replenish our resources and there's things we do that drain our resources. You can think of it as a tank. You have a tank that rises and falls throughout the day. And we're, we have so many demands in the environment. And when we use our devices, for example, we have email and Slack and so many electronic communications we have to deal with. When the demands on our attention exceed the amount of resources that we have available, we get stressed and it impacts our performance. So what do we mean by attention? So let me go back to the beginning. This is William James. He's known as the father of psychology. And William James is the first one to define attention. He says, everyone knows what attention is. It's the taking possession by the mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what seems several simultaneously possible objects or trains of thought. Focalization, concentration of consciousness are of its essence. Of course, everyone knows what attention is. But the problem is that William James didn't get the full story. Turns out there are different kinds of attention. So if you're focusing on finishing up that overdue report and you've got that deadline, you're using what's called controlled processing or controlled attention. But the thing is that when we use our devices, there's so many things we do that are just automatic, things that are just not in our conscious awareness. Like, for example, you know, when I grab my phone, right? That's automatic processing. We can't help but respond to when we hear text chimes, when we see notifications flashing across our screens. When we're driving, we automatically respond to when the traffic light turns yellow. So there are different kinds of attention. So uh, as VJ talked about, I've been studying our relationship with our technology for a very long time. I'm, I'm trained as a psychologist, and usually what psychologists do is they bring people into a laboratory, and you, you create an abstract model of the world. But if I'm studying technology, I want to understand all the forces and influences and factors that can affect people's tech use. I want to know the stress people experience, the conflicts they have, the, the things that make us laugh. And to do that, I have to go to where people are. And so what I do is I create living laboratories. And so over the years, I've used a variety of different kinds of sensors. These are unobtrusive ways of capturing things like how fast we switch screens, what our stress levels are, are people having a face-to-face -face conversation or not. And I time stamp all of these different sensors. And then holistically, I can get a pretty good understanding of what people are doing with their tech. So I'm, I'm going to go right to the punchline. And this is the punchline. I've been tracking attention over the last 20 years. And back in 2004, when we first published, uh, my graduate student, Victor Gonzalez, and I found that people's average attention on a screen was about two and a half minutes before switching. And we, we were astonished at the time. Then fast forward in 2012, Steve Voida and I found the average to be 75 seconds on a screen. And in the last five, six years, the average attention on any screen, whether it's computer or phone, is about 47 seconds. 
This has been replicated by other people as well. Andres Meyer found 50 seconds. My uh, graduate student, Fatima Akbar, uh, did a study before the pandemic, and she studied 50 information workers over a 30-day period, found the average to be 44 seconds. So our attention spans are diminishing with the rise of the digital age. Now, if you want to look at the data a little bit differently in terms of how often people are switching screens, it's the same idea as duration of attention. We see that people change screens 566 times a day on average. They check email 77 times a day. And for those people in our sample who are Facebook users, they check Facebook 38 times a day. So there's lots of attention switching going on. Now, we might have this idea, and this is a, a very popular narrative, that we should blame our interruptions completely on notifications, targeted algorithms. Uh, yes, that is a reason why we're interrupted. It's not the full reason. Uh, it turns out that about half of all interruptions are initiated by ourselves. So we might have an urge to check the news or we might have a memory that we forgot to do something. So we are as guilty of interrupting ourselves as we are from being interrupted by something external to us. So you might say, well, so what? We switch our attention every 47 seconds. What does it matter if we're working on the same project? So I'm an academic. I write papers, I have to, I, I read articles online, I, I talk to people on email, I do writing, and I'm switching between all these activities. So what does it matter? If, but if we think at the level of projects, switching between writing a paper to working on another research project to say, planning, teaching a course, these are all different projects. How often do we switch at the level of project? Here's the general pattern of what people do that we found in the data. So a person works on project A, and then they suddenly switch their attention to project B. Then they switch again to project C. Then they start to work on project D, and then they go back and pick up on project A where they left off. So it turns out that it takes about 25 and a half minutes on average for people to return back to a project that they've been interrupted from. This is the pattern of data. So it's not like people get interrupted, do something quickly, and then come right back, right? There are intervening things that people do, intervening tasks, and it creates quite a disruption in our work. So, uh, William James talked about, you know, having this focused state of attention, uh, but I want to uh, present some data to show you that attention is not just a binary state of being focused and unfocused. There are different kinds of attention. So when I started thinking about this, I realized that there are some things we do on our devices where we're really engaged and we're putting in a lot of mental effort, like I'm working on a paper, right? Or I'm trying to do some kind of analysis using Excel. But other times we might be really engaged in doing something and not at all challenged, like uh, you know, watching a Netflix film or playing a mindless game or reading social media. And so I came up with this framework of four different kinds of attention. If you're highly engaged, and you're highly challenged, putting in a lot of effort. That's what a focused state of attention is. To be focused, you really need to have some kind of mental effort uh, using cognitive resources. You can be engaged and have very low challenge, like playing solitaire, uh, and that's road attention. And if you're not challenged or not engaged, well, you're bored. And if you're highly challenged, but not at all engaged, I call that a state of frustration. It's it's like when I have a tech problem, right? I, I'm challenged by it and I'm just not 
motivated or engaged to do anything with it. So I'm frustrated. So what we did was we gave people probes throughout the day. And we asked people two very simple questions. At the time that you received this probe, how engaged were you in the thing you were just doing? And how challenged were you in the thing you were just doing? These were information workers. And they did this. Um, they took these probes over the course of a, a week. And here's what we found. We found that people have rhythms for when they're using their focused attention. So um, they have two peaks. The first peak is mid to late morning. And then there's a second peak, which is mid to late afternoon. And this coincides with the ebb and flow of these underlying cognitive resources that people have. So um, when, when you're at your peak focus, you've got a lot of resources that you can invest in what you're doing. And then when you're in a trough, you know, your resources are, are being drained. So now let's talk about multitasking. So when we think about multitasking, many people think that we're doing things in parallel. Now, you can do two things in parallel as long as one of those things uses automatic attention. Remember, automatic attention is when we're just not conscious of what we're doing. Like you can you can drive and talk with someone because driving can be automatic. But as soon as the traffic light changes to yellow or someone swerves in front of you, all of a sudden you, you begin to use controlled attention. So, but in general, if there's two activities that require us to do some kind of mental effort, controlled attention, uh, it's just not humanly possible. What we are doing is switching our attention rapidly. So that's where the 47 seconds on average comes in. So we think when we multitask, we think we're doing more, we think we're getting more done, but we're actually doing less. And here's why. So the first thing that happens is that people make more errors. And we know this from decades of studies in, in the laboratory, people are given tasks, all kinds of tasks. They're shifting their attention, trying to keep track, and they just keep making errors. And people also make errors when they multitask in the real world. And this is a, a great example. This was a study done of physicians who were multitasking, shifting their attention between the patient, their electronic devices, between uh, talking with other people. And it turns out of 239 prescriptions that they wrote, 208 of those showed errors while physicians were multitasking. The physicians were, were shadowed by researchers. That's pretty scary. And it's scarier when you realize that 12 of those errors were quite severe uh, concerning the wrong drug or the wrong dose. So multitasking is not always produce, does not always produce the best results. There's also a switch cost when we do multitasking. And let me use an analogy of an internal whiteboard to illustrate what I mean by a switch cost. So every task we do, we have a mental model of that task. So if I'm working on on my nasty report, I've got a mental model of what I need to do, the information I need, how I want to structure it. And imagine that I write that mental model on a whiteboard in my mind, and then suddenly I switch to do email. So I'm switching my attention. I'm erasing that internal whiteboard of my mind, and I'm writing the mental model that I need to do email. So you know, I have a certain pattern of doing email. I look for the sender, I look at the subject matter, and then suddenly I switch to do something else. I'm erasing that mental model of the email and I'm writing the information I need for the current task at hand. Now, just like in the real world, if you're erasing a whiteboard, sometimes there's a residue, right? Same thing happens when we're switching our attention. So imagine that you switch your attention and you read news and you've, you're reading about a horrific accident and then suddenly you switch to do something else, there can be a residue 
that accident stays with you and can interfere with your task at hand. So it's it's not always uh, efficient to switch. And, and of course, there's extra time that it takes uh, to reorient to the new task, as I illustrated with this erasing and rewriting of the whiteboard. And the nail in the coffin is that multitasking causes stress. So the, it, there is causality here. So laboratory studies show that when people multitask, their blood pressure rises. There's also a physiological marker that's been tested that indicates people have stress. Um, in, in the real world, uh, in the wild, when people multitask, uh, they report having higher perceived stress. And in our studies, using heart rate monitors to measure heart rate variability, we show an association between att fast attention shifting and stress rising. So when people shift their attention, right, it creates this vicious cycle, right? We, we get interrupted, whether it's from something external or something within ourselves, uh, it causes us to be stressed. We experience cognitive fatigue, and that makes us more susceptible to interruptions. Why? Because there's something in the mind is called the executive function. And it's a part of our mind that helps filter out distractions. It helps us self-regulate. And if that part of the mind executive function gets worn down, we, we have it has less ability to prevent us from responding to interruptions. So we see this cycle that we get into when we use our devices. So here's uh, what I'm proposing. I'd like us to reframe our goal in using tech. Instead of this big push to let's put productivity first, let's instead think about putting well being first. And if we can put well being first, it lays the groundwork for us to be productive. There's a psychological theory, it's called the broaden and build theory. And it shows, it demonstrates that when people feel more positive, they can accomplish more. It gives people a wider repertoire of actions that they can choose from. People are better able to handle conflict. They can be more creative. So let's first think about establishing well being when we use our devices, and productivity will come along the way. So, what can we do? You know, how can we achieve this? So, I believe that people can develop agency over their attention. And it's not just individual solutions. Like we can't just put the entire burden on ourselves, but we also need collective solutions. We're all intertwined in this huge web, this huge technological web. And so we also need to think of collective solutions as well. So first of all, attention is goal directed. We pay attention according to what our goal is. If my goal is to finish that uh, deadline, uh, finish my report, I'm gonna direct my attention toward that. If my goal instead becomes, you know, I wanna do something lightweight and easy, so I'm gonna go to social media, guess what? I direct my attention and go to social media. So uh, there was a study that I did with colleagues from Microsoft Research. And what we did was we gave people, a, they worked with a conversational agent and it asked them two simple questions at the beginning of the day. The first was, uh, what do you want to accomplish today? That was their task goal. The second question is, how do you wanna feel? That was their emotional goal. And simply by answering two, those two questions at the beginning of the day, people stayed on track more. However, we also learned that the results are not long lasting, right? They just last a short amount of time. And so we discovered that goals need to be consistently reinstated. People need to be reminded of goals. You can't just do it once at the beginning of the day and forget about it. 
This, this work, this idea uh, originates from a social psychologist called Albert Bandura, who studied the idea of self-efficacy. And he was very successful at getting people to uh, do things like stop substance abuse and stop smoking. And I came to this idea uh, of practicing meta-awareness uh, during the pandemic when I took a course in mindfulness. Meta-awareness refers to the idea of being aware of what you're doing as it's unfolding. There's so many actions we do that are just unconscious. Uh, this kind of automatic attention I talked about earlier, like um, you know, grabbing our phone uh, when we hear a text chime. And meta-awareness is about being more intentional and being reflective on our actions. So it, it, you can do it by probing yourself. So recognizing the urge that you have to switch screens and go read the news or go on social media and to probe yourself and ask why you're doing it. And you know, for me, it's usually because I'm bored or I'm procrastinating, um, but it's, it's taught me to be self-reflective. And this kind of probing exercise has now become second nature for me. And it's really helped me a lot and prevents me from switching screens. You can also practice forethought. And forethought means imagining how our current actions will impact our future selves. So before I make that screen switch to go check news, and I'm a news junkie, um, I imagine what my life is going, my future self is going to be like and the end of the day is a good time frame. So at 7 p.m., what do I want to be doing? I want to be relaxing, having a glass of wine, reading my favorite book. Uh, I don't want to still be working on that deadline. And so the more concrete your visualization is, the more powerful it is. So you, you can use forethought to help keep yourself on track. And uh, remember, I mentioned that people have rhythms of attention throughout the day. So get to know when your peak focus times are. It does relate to your chronotype. If you're an early type, your peaks will be earlier. If you're a late type, they'll be later. Um, you, can, you can do a simple exercise. Keep a diary of when, you're, uh, when you feel that your focus is at its peak. And instead of scheduling tasks with a time frame. This is what we typically do. It's 11 o'clock, I'm gonna do this task. 12 noon, I'm gonna do this task. Instead, design your day and plan to do those tasks that require the, the hardest work and the most creative energy. Do those at the time when you are at your peak focus and you'll perform a lot better. And don't waste your peak focus do, doing email or, or doing social media. So what is the future of attention? And this is where we can think about collective solutions because a lot of people talk about, oh, it's simple, do a digital detox. But doing a digital detox is like doing a crash diet. You know, it works for a while, you feel great, but then you have to come back and people pick up their bad habits again. We, the ship has sailed, we live in a technological world we just can't stay away from it. And for any individual to really pull away, uh, it penalizes that individual, especially if you're an information worker, you need access to information. We, we lose access to uh, our loved ones and our friends uh, and family. So we need to think about solutions collectively as well as individually. So first of all, it has to start at the top, leadership of organizations need to realize that well-being comes first. They need to understand that instead of pushing people to their limits and getting them exhausted, let's think about nurturing well-being and laying the groundwork for being productive. Uh, so one thing that management can do is to allow quiet time, where, which is free from electronic communications, right? Uh, this could be done through batching email or setting aside a period of time when no electronic communications can be sent. Uh, this is, um, uh, you know, this allows people then 
to, you know, to be able to focus on the task at hand. Uh, also, to understand that people have rhythms of attention and to give people flexibility to be able to schedule their days uh, to leverage when they have these peak focus times, because then they'll be able to do more. And last is to understand the importance to allow people to psychologically detach from work at the end of the day. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows there are carryover effects. The stress we experience during the day gets carried over into our personal life. And if we don't give ourselves a chance to psychologically detach, this stress can develop into chronic stress. Uh, some countries have laws, even France has the El Khomri law, it's called the right to disconnect law, and employees cannot be penalized for not answering electronic communications after work hours. Uh, the Ireland has similar policy, and Ontario, Canada also has similar policy. I'm, I'm a big advocate for right to disconnect laws. So I'd like to uh, close with this uh, Japanese expression, which is called yohaku no bi, which means the beauty of empty space. And when the Japanese design gardens, it's not just the, the beautiful rocks that they choose, but it's the space around the these rocks that are really well thought out. And you know, it just enables these the, the beauty of these rocks to shine. And it's the same in our days. Let's incorporate negative space into our day. This is time that we can use for contemplation, meditation, or even time to go off and take a really substantial break. It's really important and supports, uh, supports us in building back up our attentional resources and helping us shine at work. So I would like to thank you. You can reach me here on LinkedIn. Uh, Twitter. You can come to my website and learn more about the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gloria. That was eye-opening as always. Uh, it's sort of interesting because the last time I think, not counting the recent viewings I've done of your book talks, sort of this is very much in the trajectory of what you've been doing. But I have to say the numbers are staggering and alarming. I, I, I would be surprised if, the, uh, perhaps you can stop sharing, Gloria. Uh, sure. Um, so I would be surprised if anybody in the audience does not relate to this. I certainly, <laughs> you know, this is, it's personal. And as an applied economist who studies the impact of technology and productivity, I have to confess that we never think about in our work, at least sort of we think about the macroeconomic impacts of technology and productivity, but, you know, mm -hmm. the macroeconomic output is consists of the aggregation of all of our individual outputs, right? And so well-being is very central to that. But I was just struck by some, so many things you said about attention span, both in the book and in your talk today. But so attention span is diminishing. We see it not just in digital media, as you, but also in the way movies are made, for example. Yes. Uh, you know, the little sequences, the shot length in movies has been declining. And every time I watch a movie targeted at, at young people, and we'll leave it at that, I don't relate because it's it, it's sort of a different world. And these are people who are more enmeshed in their digital devices. And even then people like me who are actually quite, uh, I don't know the right word is, but habituated by it with our, with our it's become a, a habit that isn't always productive. Do you think there's a causal, and, and of course we hear about sort of teen anxiety and depression and numbers that we haven't seen before. Do you think there's a causal relationship between technology and attention span? I, I think in some aspects, yes. Uh, the thing you mentioned about the film and uh, TV. Yeah, expand on that because people happen may not have read the book. Yeah, so um, shot lengths in film and TV, you know, used to be much longer. Now they average four seconds. And you, you see this very clearly if you watch, say, TV and just turn the audio down, then you really are aware of the shifting. Now, I, I can't say there's a causal connection between that and our attention spans, because it could be film, TV, and directors are influenced by their own short attention spans right. to make it shorter. So we we can only say that these are parallel trends. But we, we also know, like uh, social media platforms, constrain the length of content that we mm -hmm. can post 
It, it forces us to consume things in short snippets, to snack, right? And um, we also know there's another trend that's happening that people are speeding up their podcasts, their YouTube videos, even uh, professors' lectures, right? right? People now watch them in one and a half uh, speed or or faster. So there's we're seeing these trends across a lot of different media. We do know, I mean, the, the one thing that we can say is that we have more sources for interruptions now than we've ever had before, right? And we can, you know, there's a there's a lot of um a lot of influences behind the use of social media. For example, there's social dynamics that mm -hmm. compel us. We're we're social creatures and we're just compelled to check social media. We're compelled to answer email because we want to maintain social capital. Uh, so there's there's a lot uh, to unpack there. Yeah, that's really interesting because when I was thinking about this, when I grew up as a major in computer science, there was only one screen. You went to work, yeah. went to a computer center and you coded on a screen, right? And then when you went home or went back to your dorm room, there was not much more to do on a screen because you didn't have access to one. Fast forward, and you know, then of course we went through PCs and, and now you know, then the BlackBerry, and I remember the flashing blue light and how that would always make you want to pick it up to see, you know, what next piece of junk mail you might have received. All the way to today where we got watches, we've got phones, we've got tablets, we've got laptops. Yeah. There's so many interruptions yeah. non nonstop, right? So this is, I mean, so clearly there's this, this, this never ending pressure or stimuli from the external environment. But one of the things I found most remarkable about some of the, the one of the more remarkable insights in your book was so much of this is sort of uh, self-initiated. So yeah. we could be interrupted by bosses sending emails that we have to reply to or tasks that have to get done. But when I look at social media or when I, if I'm on Twitter and luckily I'm on Twitter less and less because that platform has become less attractive. Um, but but you see how many people, how many professors in my case are actually spending hours a day on, on Twitter. I noticed that, right? So you've got to believe that there's an impact on productivity. Um, so that sort of encouraged me. So, so let's that, switch then. So we recognize this is a problem. It's a bigger problem than it's ever been, I think. And I think your mm -hmm. research supports that. And you sort of began to get into what do we do about it? So let's dig a little bit deeper into sort of that piece of it. Uh, for example, one of the things we've always talked about is multitasking. I always thought that was a good thing. Uh, and, and, you know, we were proud, we'd go around, you know, because I also have an operations research minor, so it was always like, what's the shortest time to get things done? But the reality is very different. Talk yeah. more about how multitasking causes stress and anxiety and, and, some, and maybe a little bit deeper into some of these studies that show some of these negative aspects on your health. Yeah, so you know, when you multitask, it's it's like juggling plates. Imagine that you have six plates and you're trying to keep them spinning, right? We, in, even though we might be working on one task and our attention is on one task, in the back of our minds, we've got all these sp spinning plates. There, there's something called the Zygarnik effect. I, I love this study. The study was done by Bluma Zygarnik about a hundred years ago. Right. And so, some of the best, psychology studies were done, you know, in the 19th century or 100 years ago, she found that interrupted tasks are remembered better than tasks that are finished. Why is that the case? It's because, you know, there's something in our minds that just keep nagging at us to get back and finish it. When something's finished, it's off our plate. And so imagine when you're multitasking, you've got you're working on one thing and you've got these six other tasks with the Zygarnik effect in full swing that's nagging at you, reminding you that you need to get back to it. And sometimes we do forget mm -hmm. uh, about tasks, right? And and then you remember and, and that causes stress because, you know, we had left it too long. But the, the, the general reason why we experience so much stress is just the impact on our attentional resources. We have this, this limited amount of attentional resources and they're, they're spread very thin when we multitask. And we need resources, not just for doing the task, but we're using the resources for 
switching. I talked about the whiteboard and the switch cost. So it's a tank that leaks and it's right. leaking these precious resources. And when our demands exceed the amount of resources we have available, that's that's the definition of stress. Yeah, you, you, you know, and we've all had the, whether it's work and you're working on some deep problem that needs to be solved or you have a difficult conversation, I'm sure all of us can relate to feeling fatigued at the end of these, like it's physical fatigue, even though you've been sitting in a chair and using your brain more than anything else or things like that. So that certainly relates uh, from, from, from that perspective. Uh, one of the things I sort of smiled when you were speaking about was at the end of the day, it always seems to end up in Buddhism of some form, right? Uh, Bu Buddhism, because, you know, you, because at, at some level, a lot of this sort of these older religions talk about sort of a state of awareness, a sort of intentionality yeah. and, and, and things like that. And I, I, so, so I do, so I was smiling when you said that, because I think clearly yoga and all these things, which we use to deep, which we're told to use to sort of manage our stress, but there's really a sense, I, I think if there's one message I took away from this and, you know, we can put sort of the phrases on it, but it's really about a sense of awareness of how you are actually allocating your time. Yeah, thinking it's, about the consequences of, of of the decisions you make now, even though you're often making them without thinking about. Yeah, it's it's a game changer, right? It's a game changer to be reflective of our actions and and to be really aware of them and to think of the consequences, and yeah. and that's the thing we we just tend to think about, you know, let's do something fun now. Let's go to yeah. social media and we react instead of you know being thoughtful. So I'm going to ask you one last question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. And we have lots and lots of questions already. And so, so you know, you talked about how we allocate time across the day based on sort of how your body clock is going. So I know, my luckily for me, my mentor taught me things about, you know, work on the hardest research question, part of, part of your research paper when you are most research productive and use other times to send emails or read something that you need, that's necessary for research, but isn't as demanding a mental task. How do sort of people in more managerial roles think about allocating that sort of their 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 attention span through the day? Yeah, so it's it's tough for them because they have to react to the demands of the environment. So I they have less control over when mm -hmm. they can but but one thing they can do is they can schedule meetings. And so meetings that require say tough decision making or uh, creativity, they can schedule those meetings, right? Yes. For when they are productive. But, you know, there's a bit of a social dilemma here. And this happens in groups because what may be a peak focus time for a manager may not be the same for the employees, right? So there's, there, it is a social dilemma. Uh, what's best for the individual may not be the best for the group. So I'm going to start with a personal question from you, Yui Saito, because it's, it's, it's very personal. And he says, he's asking you directly. I'm, I'll read them out to you. Feel free to read them yourself. But what is your relationship with social media like? I've been struggling to have my free time without opening social media app, especially at night. And he's a little frown, I guess. So do you have any structure that works for you? And I think all of us, I picked that because I certainly can relate to that. I'm always in trouble at home for my use of social media. So. Yeah. You personally so, handle it. Yeah. I, I, I used to spend a lot more time on social media. Um, now I, I just limit my time. I spend about 10 minutes and I think about, you know, I, I usually just go to Twitter or LinkedIn once a month, I'll go to Facebook and I just, I have these like 10 minutes and I just allocate a few minutes for each. And if I'm going to post something, I pretty much think ahead of time what I'm going to post, and then I just post it, and and it's done. And I I just I'm I'm very good about limiting my time. Why? Because you know it goes back to the idea of meta awareness. I also probe myself if I'm still getting value in in doing something. So if I'm scrolling through social media. And I used to do this. I would probe myself, is there still value here? Mm -hmm. And if I was honest, no, there wasn't value. <laughs> Once in a while, I, I would hit on some really interesting piece of information, but but chances are no. 
And so I, I, by realizing the answer enough times that no, there just really yeah. wasn't value. And it, it I, is, I, I think we will, it is intentionality, right? Because you look back and say, okay, 20 minutes went by and all I got was details about something that I didn't care about in the first place, but I went down that rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Jasmine Henry, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. What are your thoughts on the relationship between dwindling attention span and information retention? So is it affecting how we retain information? Oh, what a great question. Um, I'm not sure that there's research that shows that our information retention is less. And the reason is that um, you would have to put people in an environment where they're switching their attention really fast and then testing retention. We know when people are stressed, it affects their retention. They retain things uh, less. But um, I'm not thinking, I, I'm not re myself thinking of any study that's tested attention shifting and retention. But I would bet if I had to put money on it, I would bet that um, the faster people switch, the worse is their uh, recall of information. You know, it, it reminds me of things like, you know, you, when we would say, even in school, we were taught if you write something out, you remind you, you, you remember it better versus yeah. reading, right? So there's, there's some seeming pattern there, which is, and I certainly find that, you know, when you move so quickly from topic to topic it's conceivable certainly that 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 you you could be a little more forgetful of things yeah know. so so we when we process anything deeply we remember it when we process things in a very shallow way we don't remember it yeah so when people are switching their attention they're more than likely processing things in a very shallow way this is, a, this is a sort of a, a question that I'm not sure you will have the answer to, but it's from Don McRae. And he says, what is, and he's given us a choice of questions we can answer. So I'm just going to pick on one. Is there any relationship between the flow of attention, the peaks and valleys, and the physiological effects of eating? Uh, oh. It's an out there question. And sugar levels or insulin levels in the blood. I don't know if you have the answer to that, but I figured I'll take a shot here. I, I don't have the answer to that, but I do know, of course, when there are sugar crashes, people get sure. fatigued and, you know, can't pay attention. So uh, I guess it depends on what people are eating. And, you know, I, I think it's uh, that that's something that. Yeah, no, I, I suspect no yeah. worries. Uh, uh, Natalie Whitlock asks about the importance of leadership support. And this is obviously central to what we at the business school talk about a lot. Uh, any tips to get leaders on board? It's, it's just like a, on so many of these things, like where does the where do the initiatives come from? Because I think so many employees are feeling the pressure and the stress, yeah. but their so, organizations aren't responding. Yeah. I mean, they have to be convinced that employee presenteeism is really valuable. Presenteeism refers to not, not just showing up at the workplace, but really being motivated, being, you know, being able to do your job, being creative at your job, being, um, you know, also intrinsically motivated, right? And if people are exhausted, right, they, they just can't summon up that kind of motivation and creativity. So management has to realize that, you know, like I talked about setting, laying the groundwork to enable people to perform their best. Yeah, you know, and for luckily for those of us in career, careers like us, we have much more ability to sort of set the rules of the game uh, as, you know, we have more agency than I suspect in many, many careers, but it's got to be hard because in fact, Leonard Lane is a strategy professor at UCI, says very important, very interesting and important to recognize your points. However, what advice would you have for those of us that work globally and must adjust to the demands of different time zones and cultures, which adds a whole new wrinkle to yeah. how you allocate time during the day? The, the time zone problem is just, it, it's really tough to, to crack that. There, there is no good answer. Um, there really isn't. 
Some yeah. someone someone is disadvantaged, right? You know, and, you know, and you see a lot of these statistics and call center productivity and and spread. There's been a lot of studies of those. It's not necessarily time zone. It, it's time zone in the sense that they're awake all night because they're servicing customers from India to the West. And the burnout levels and the stress levels and the impact on health is well documented. Actually, people quit at very very high rates. So it doesn't help mm. in some ways, but that's sort of the. Um, um, I, I'm not sure I'm saying going to say his name correctly. Uh, it's a Gabor Mester. I manage a large global team. Uh, da, 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 da. Are there any tips for the very remote workers I cannot meet? So he, he says I am handling my local work as well. The, how do I mean? How do I tips for the give tips to the remote workers that I cannot meet in person to maintain balance when I can't provide the same in person guidance? Yeah, it, that's a great question. So I, I've been doing a study of remote teams and uh, we we were studying them during the pandemic and, and then after. And um, it turns out that some of the more successful teams had managers who would intentionally set up meetings with people, would reach out to the uh, people uh, on their teams and you know checking in, finding out how they're doing. And not just having a regularly scheduled team meeting, but just going above and beyond to make sure that these people, you know, really felt included. Because when you work remotely, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. So, um, and, you know, people who are, some people who work remotely struggle a lot with distraction, with loneliness, uh, with lack of motivation. The motivation has changed. In the workplace, you're motivated by seeing other people. You get all kinds of uh, social stimulation. When people are working at home, they have to rely on themselves to gather up that motivation. So I think leaders can help motivate people who are remote by meeting with them. Yeah, uh, I'm going to combine two questions. Cynthia Rood and Beth England Mackey. Cynthia is a head of career services. Within university careers, we're moving towards social and emotional intelligence development with students. And mm -hmm. uh, does this go together in your opinion? And with Beth, the question is, how do we help students understand the value of making time to disconnect, especially our newest generation? So these are all about sort of preparing students for the future, whether for careers or uh, or just managing their own well-being. Yeah, I that. mean, we as educators, we have a golden opportunity to educate students on the importance of that. You know, students, really have a lot of struggles. Um, they have heavy coursework. They have multiple projects at the same time. They, they are multitasking like crazy. And on top of that, they have financial pressures and social pressures. So I, I really feel for, um, for students, uh, what can we do? You know, I, I, I wish that there would be a system where assignments could somehow be distributed, the load of assignments could be distributed over students so that they're they're not stuck with doing you know really heavy loads one particular week. Uh, that would be that would be the ideal. May, maybe AI can help in actually that, that leads me to the, that leads me to the next question because Matthews and mm -hmm. I'm probably not going to say his, ask them correctly. Watch Norwich. Uh, in regards to the glory of Parks, Mark's points on companies focusing on the well-being of its employees, it's their productivity, uh, and relate, well, so on. I'm going to shorten it to: Could utilizing AI be a good way to increase productivity while increasing well-being? Um, I'm going to say cautiously, yes, I think so, and and here's why: uh, AI can do a lot of mundane tasks that you know instead of people doing them for example i could imagine a um a, a chat gpt that understands my work so well that it can take care of my email for me and that saves me three hours a day so i wouldn't have to do it um and i imagine that there's a lot of other tasks that you know, for example, summarizing things that instead of my putting in the time to summarize it, I, I can use uh, chat GP to do it. However, <laughs> there's there's a lot of um, caveats here. Uh, for example, 
there was a study that uh, two researchers from MIT did that showed that, yes, ChatGPT allows people to summarize and produce reports faster uh, than people doing them on their own. That's great. But if we think, if we kind of pull back, we can produce more information, but our minds are still a bottleneck. Right. And so let's think about what does that mean to be able to produce more information faster of to what end of what use for us. So I think there's there's a lot of questions that need to be answered about AI. Um, there's, of course, a lot of uh, potential harms. We you know, I, I don't think we want to go there right now. But I, I think in, in some respects, yeah, there is a potential for AI to help us out. So there's two questions. Sanjeev has a question, and, and Abby has a question. What's the best way to not multitask when you're set up in a, when you're in an environment that you can't help? Uh, and Abby sort of asked, I think it's a related question. Is there any value in limiting the communication with people who have demands on you? Should we stop accepting texting and WhatsApp from work-related people, vendors, business, considering that 85% of text messages are reviewed immediately? So the sort of this, this is really getting down to the nitty gritty of what do we actually do day to day? Yeah, so um, we are, like I talked about, we're caught up in this web, this interconnected technological web, and it's just not possible for any individual to pull out. And, you know, that's where I think leadership needs to step in, where it needs to come from the top to you know, set up a quiet time so everyone has the expectation that there's no message that's going to come for a period of time and gives people a chance to, to really concentrate on work or, you know, getting, using other methods for delivering communication, putting, putting organizational communications on a website so people pull the information instead of it constantly getting pushed at us. There, there have been so many, um, proposals for different kinds of email solutions, uh, such as, you know, figuring out, paying people to send an email. Uh, but none of these solutions have actually taken hold. So um, I think I think that the best thing we can do is to just establish a time during the day where all electronic communications are verboten. Yeah, so uh, my apologies to the people whose questions I couldn't get to. We have questions. We have time for just one more question. And I'm going to go to Anil Augustine. And he, he basically says, are we moving from more left brain to more right brain sort of activities? Should we be giving more focus to human experience of emotion of the emotional and em empathy aspects of our work, which is uh, in a sort of AI plays into sort of his, his question as well. But uh, is that sort of what ultimately we're emphasizing? Let's let's think about sort of uh, sort of the emotional self and sort of the ability to empathize and so on. I I think there that, that uh, there's a really good point there. Uh, we've we're caught up in this culture of productivity. Let's produce as much as we can. We are getting ourselves exhausted. I've been studying people for decades and have just heard so many reports about people, uh, you know, people's stress and exhaustion. And let's step back. And yes, let's think about empathy. Leaders can have more empathy toward employees. And let's think about what our emotional goals are. Let, let's consider that every task has an emotional valence associated with it. Some tasks are fun make us happy, some things aren't. And let's think about, you know, how we can arrange tasks over the day. So we're not doing, a, a, you know, several hard tasks in a row that just make us unhappy, but can we inter intersperse them? Can we think about doing things, um, showing kindness to colleagues, for example, that things that make us happy, you know, what are things we can do that, you know, don't ordinarily exist today. So Gloria, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your research with us. You know, the pandemic taught us a lot about sort of mental health and well-being, you know, as we were all dealing with our social isolation and we're not fully back in so many ways, work environments aren't the same. 
So yeah. I think it's really important that we, you know, sort of focus on the kinds of questions that you've been focusing on for so long. You've picked sort of a really interesting set of research questions to work on, which with every passing year have increased relevance and have a material impact on how we as humans sort of get through this and survive and thrive. So thank you for all the work that you do. I think it's really meaningful. Honored to have you as a colleague at UCI with that buy the book. It's fantastic. Attention span, uh, buy it at your uh, online online uh, store or buy it at an independent bookseller. Uh, but please read the book. It is absolutely wonderful reading and will help improve your life. Uh, with that, thank you all. Thank you to our sponsors, KPMG and the Beale Family Foundation for supporting our work. Uh, I have to say personally, it's a great pleasure, even though in a webinar, I don't get to see your faces. Uh, I, I check the attendee list before we sign on, and it is just a delight to see so many old friends and students and people I've gotten to know over the years, in addition to the new people I get to know uh, through these events. Uh, lots of applause for you on the screen. Zoom does make some <laughs> things easier. Thank you again, Gloria. Thank you all for attending. We couldn't do this without you, and we just love that so many of you had joined us at so many of our events. Thank you all for your attention. Again, thank you, Gloria. Good night, thank everybody. You.